Hey, welcome back. It's been a while, I know. Before we start, I want to present you with a little experiment. Let's split this canvas in two. I'll paint one side with 80% blue, and I'll paint the other side with 80% blue and 1% green. And we can merge these two. And I'll delete the bottom two layers. Okay, hide the line. Now these two colors are almost indistinguishable to the naked eye. I'll apply an exposure filter. And what do you think is going to happen when I push this slider all the way to the right? This is gonna be A, the image will become very blue and stop changing. B, the image will become white and stop changing. Or C, the image will turn to sh**. Correct. The image turned to sh**. It makes no sense whatsoever for these two formerly indistinguishable colors to become so different after we increase the exposure. I can 100% guarantee that you've already seen this kind of cyan in digital photography, especially in your usual day-to-day -day smartphone photos. The gradient of the sky goes from nice dark blue to lighter blue, then breaks into cyan and eventually turns white. This is called a hue shift and it's prominent everywhere. The sky, the sun, even your selfies in room lighting. You can even notice it in some 3D animation renders. Here's an exaggerated example with a 3D render. Watch the background sky blue turn into cyan and the orangey brown sphere turn into yellow. Hue shifts are all over the place. So what would be the expected result? The image should turn to white as I increase the exposure, just like it does, for example, in Darktable using the Filmic RGB module. It makes sense that the minute differences between the two colors is kept, and it only makes sense that substantial overexposure leads to completely wide image. The people who engineered film photography knew it, even the painters of Renaissance knew it, but somehow digital color came and we forgot. Thankfully, this bad image formation has awoken a bunch of smart, angry people who had enough knowledge and skill to try and fix the awful imagery we're bombarded with daily. Now it's up to us to use the tools and recognize and point out the terrible things that are done to imagery. Remember the ugly 3D render? Well, now let's watch the filmic render side by side with our earlier render. Same scene, but the outcome looks much nicer and much more natural. Almost like a painting, almost film-like. Even popular software like Adobe Lightroom does this to an extent. Of course, they have no control over it, but it's there somewhere. Hold on, you might say. Aren't you just talking about display-referred and scene-referred workflows? Yes and no, but I don't want to get into that in this video as this will need a video rant of its own. The terminology is really fuzzy right now. While it settles, it's best that we focus on the image and the result. It's the image that is of utmost importance to us and the viewer. Just keep in mind that photography is art and don't limit yourself by trying to replicate the real world in your photos. It's not possible and probably never will be. Create images that are excellent, beautiful, interesting as an object on its own, not some sort of 2D bargain bin representation of the real world. You know what's not an image? Data. Data you capture with your digital camera. That data is not an image until we develop it and turn it into an image. Until we touch it, it's just a bunch of sensor readouts. People call them raw images, but I'm not a fan of that name either. Camera native data capture file is a mouthful, but it represents that raw files are different from camera to camera. And most importantly, it recognizes that the data capture is not an image. I'm just going to call it scene this. Just kidding, we'll figure something out as we go. So how do we turn not an image into an image? 
We use tools, good modern tools that help us form the image in the way that it's intuitive and most importantly, makes sense. Darktable's Filmic RGB is one of those tools. The Filmic RGB module in Darktable was created by Aurelien Pierre, who was inspired by Troy Sobotka, the person who made Filmic for Blender. The idea of the whole Filmic thing is that it mimics film in both highlight and shadow desaturation, as well as beautiful highlight and shadow roll-offs, avoiding hue shifts as much as possible. Basically, it is a view transform. It takes the data captured by a camera and forms an image that your monitor is able to display with the help of a few modules and your input. That way we avoid the issue that was shown at the beginning of the video. We can avoid hue shifts, posterization and other unpredicted distortions that ruin our picture. Let's have a better look at what is going on. I have Darktable opened, where I have a bunch of test images that help us limit test and better visualize the changes to our photos. You can already see that we're encountering the same issue we've encountered at the beginning of the video. The ugly broken blue has turned into cyan and is ruining our landscape. Let's fix that by simply enabling the Filmic RGB module. Notice how the blue just transitions to white without any hue shift whatsoever. There's no cyan, there's no posterization, there's no clipped highlights below the sun. Everything's nice and smooth. Similarly, the same issue can be seen in sunsets. The red-orange sunset can turn into ugly yellow really quickly. This is also a hue shift and it's something Filmic can fix. There we go, much better. We can compare these two side by side. Look at the difference. This looks harsh, overcooked and almost deep fried, whereas this feels natural and smooth. First of all, let's get familiar with Filmic RGB. There are a few buttons that will help us better understand how it all works. The A button turns the axis labels on. That helps us immensely. And the rotate button switches between different modes of graphs that show us what Filmic RGB is doing. Let's settle on the first one that's called look only. That's what we care about the most right now. The orange dot somewhere in the middle indicates the middle gray point. Notice that the middle gray of your capture is mapped to 18% of the display's luminance. Why not 50%, you might ask? Because humans perceive lightness in a non-linear way. This is where we mix some biology into physics. We humans are quite a bit more sensitive to changes in dark tones compared to the same incremental changes in bright tones. Here's a very awful example. At home, your room is illuminated by what? One or two lights? But at the office, you have arrays and arrays of lights, and they don't feel that much brighter than the feeling in the room. While the change between 1, 2 and 3 lights feel massive, a change between 20, 21 or 22 lights feel minuscule, even though we're adding the same amount of light. The 18% of luminance of the LEDs in your display become an on-screen color picker value of 0.5, in perfect conditions of course. The middle gray point is set and adjusted when you adjust the exposure in the exposure module. If you have a lot of dark tones in your image that you want to be visible, the balance might look off. But it's perfectly normal, as the gray point of 0 EV of the capture is always pinned to the 18% of luminance of the display. The middle gray or neutral gray has that name for a reason. In ideal conditions, it stays neutral. It does not obtain chroma or saturation, and it does not get brighter or dimmer when you adjust the contrast, until a certain point in your image making pipeline, of course. What else can we see in this graph? Well, the main subject is this white S curve. Values from the camera file are mapped to the display according to the curve. Lowest brightness values in the capture 
will get pinned to the lowest luminance of your display. The highest values of your capture will be mapped to maximum luminance of your display. It's in your control where you set these points using black and white relative exposure. See these numbers change? These S-bands provide smooth transitions between shadows and midtones, then midtones and highlights. That way we avoid clipping in post and the dreaded hue shifts. Lastly, there's this gray line which indicates saturation. This is also mimicking how film behaves. The more you expose the film, the brighter and less saturated it gets, same in the dark areas. The darker it gets, the less saturated it becomes. This alone is an incredible feature of the tool, as it saves all those pretty sunsets of ours. Not only sunsets, but the bright objects that usually get the gaudy digital look, as it fails to lose saturation with intensity. This curve will not be present in later darkroom iterations, but I think it's important and it's good to know what it does and how it interacts with the image. Desaturation feels very natural, as it's the best way to convey brightness, in my opinion. If you look at this extreme example, you will notice that the light sword illuminates the character, but the character looks completely flat, especially in this area. Now if we desaturate that area using filmic RGB, we will actually get some information back that we can understand. It's still perfectly clear that the light sword is red and it emits red light that is very strong, even if some parts of this figurine are less red and more white. And this exactly is the secret source of filmic and filmic RGB. The red sword is an excellent, extreme example, but these things happen to us every day, everywhere. Sunsets, skies, lamps, Christmas lights, incoming light through a window from outside, fire, foreheads, reflections. The list never ends. It's time for this grotesque mockery of photography to end. Let's move forward, somewhere where everything doesn't look like a deep-fried nuclear apocalypse. That's a lot of information to process for one time. We'll finish examining the filmic RGB module in part 2 of the series, where I shake my fist at the sky some more. Don't forget to check out the links in the description if you want more information on this topic. Thanks for watching, I hope you learned something new today. See you soon, bye!